Welcome to Cinema 5D On The Couch, the talk show with filmmakers and industry leaders. Brought to you by G-Technology, Rode Microphones, Movidium, Red Shark, Film Convert, and FNV. Welcome to another episode of Cinema 5D On The Couch. Thanks to our dear sponsors, Qi Technology, Rode Microphones, Movidium.com, F&V, and Film Convert. Convert. We are happy to welcome another round of guests. Uh, this time, it's Camille Tamiola, yes, sir. Tom Barnes, and Lucas Gilman. So that's the photographer's show, I guess. <laughs> Guys, what are you working on right now? Um, I've been, I just finished shooting a campaign with Phase One, medium format manufacturer. And it was a campaign uh, shot in the very heart of Mont Blanc Massif. So a little bit of... Uh, oh yeah, I saw the Facebook photos. Yeah, a little bit of Facebook photos. And also I had the film crew filming with me because they just released the new software, Capture One Eight, And I was a part of the team working on the software and testing it. So it's uh, it was really very busy time. But uh, I think it all went well. Nice. So, yeah. Uh, I can't really talk about what I've got coming up, but I can talk about what I've been doing. So I've had um, a job on for Channel 4 in the UK. Um, with Jamie Oliver's production company shooting a, for a campaign where we try and get kids back into um, or ca kids access to musical instruments from an early age. Uh, I don't know if you know, but in the UK basically they cut the funding for musical instruments. Oh. So basically there's been a big campaign called Don't Stop the Music to try and get kids back into uh, or, or access to instruments to try and learn. Obviously because musical instruments are kind of a, a large part of my life. Um, I've been shooting a few magazine covers, a few things like that. I was out with a band called Five Seconds of Summer who apparently are, are huge at the moment, kind of on tour One Direction. Um, and I was just out with a couple of UK bands, a band called Alt-J and a few things like that. So it's uh, yeah, it's been a busy couple of months. So you're still doing a lot of music stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, it's mainly it's mainly music stuff. The, the Don't Stop the Music, I would say, is like just portraiture. It's not really kind of, it's not what I would consider my usual music work. Yeah. My usual music work would be working with bands like Arctic Monkeys and like that sort of thing, like a proper bands as opposed to, you know, children in a marching band kind of thing, which is what we did the other day. So, uh, yes, probably it's kind of still music orientated. I think I'll always be pigeonholed a little bit as that kind of guy. So, it's all right, though. I You're also it. shooting a few music videos or mostly? No, at the moment, I mean, I have done um, a few kind of, but I haven't really done anything for a couple of months, mainly because the photo work got so busy, I haven't had time to do it. And as you guys know, how much work goes into them. So I just haven't really found time. I think there's going to be a couple coming up in the next kind of couple of months. So we'll kind of see how that mm -hmm. kind of all comes out. So. Yeah, cool. And you, Lucas? Uh, <clears throat> just uh, been super busy uh, working on the new uh, Nikon D810 campaign. We went to Iceland and uh, also the new uh, Nikkor uh, 20 millimeter 1.8, which just was, they were, uh, the new f lens was just announced at uh, IBC. So it's been super busy uh, after that and just, uh, you know, doing press tours and things like that. Cool. So did you also shoot the video for the, the 810? No, they had a f uh, film crew from the UK come in to shoot the behind the scenes. I did shoot a bunch of uh, uh, snippets of video. Uh, they, they, the production schedule and the, the list of uh, needs was so long that unfortunately there was not a lot of video. The, um, but we did shoot a, a short time lapse piece which turned out really <coughs> beautiful. Um, internal uh, time lapse function the camera with uh, exposure smoothing. So it's pretty cool because it uh, basically builds the time lapse for you. Um, it comes out as a 1080 full HD 60p uh, time lapse, and you know you've got uh, the you can shoot it flat, or you, so you can color grade it, or you can have it with preset uh, uh, picture controls, so you can have like very rich sunsets and things like that. So it basically applies the frame blending over the video at the end, Th right? Throughout the whole thing, yeah. So it, you basically put it on aperture priority, uh, <coughs> push the start, figure out how long you want it to be. Uh, walk away, it could be sunrise, sunset, and it basically will change the exposure throughout that uh, sequence. It puts it together into an MOV file, and at the end you have a, you can see it, it's pretty, it's almost addicting, because you're like, oh, I just spent like six hours shooting time lapses and uh, I lost track of time, but it's really fun. Something, cool. a new, uh, a new uh, tool in the toolbox, I guess you could say. Nice. Is it shooting raw, like time lapses? Do you uh, still end up with the with the photos at the end? You, you only have the uh, MOV file at the end. Okay. It puts them all into that HD 60p file. And also, you don't have the high resolution anymore. You don't know it's because it's that's but one it's thing that I enjoy yeah. having. You know, like totally higher, to just to zoom yeah. into that time lapse. Exactly. Afterwards. So it's not yeah. uh, okay. the the individual files, but it's uh, super user friendly. So it's you know obviously the old school method of 
shooting a thousand frames, putting them in a timeline, and doing your own. So you have, I mean, you could have 8K with 36 megapixels if you wanted to push in. But um, for a quick, uh, quick time lapse, it's it's pretty nice. Mm -hmm. um, I like that the D810 is, I think, really really good for video, but. The day they released it was probably a bad day with the Sony announcement, like uh, maybe around the same time. Yeah. yeah. So, but everybody's overlooking that because it, I think it got, they got rid of all the aliasing, right? And the more yeah, uh, the the new uh, video processor, which I don't know anything internally of how they did it. it the video that we shot was really clean um, and uh, looked really nice. We did it in uh, the one five crop mode as well as uh, using the full sensor, and we didn't see any any aliasing or anything like that. Yeah. Cool. What do you think in general, guys, about, I mean, the whole photography world has been, you know, through this big revolution over the past 15 years, I guess. Um, I would say the video and film world is still in the middle of it. You know, we have now this pixel hype, the 4K hype that you guys had 10 years ago, megapixel mm -hmm. hype. Um, how did it change your business? I mean, were you already in business 10 years ago or did you start at that time or how has... How have jobs changed? How has you know whole profession changed over over time with technology? Who wants to go first? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not everybody at once. All right, I, go, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I started ten years ago, so I've kind <coughs> of grown up with all the hype. So to be honest, I can't really say how jobs have changed because obviously, as I've kind of grown as a photographer, the jobs have become bigger and bigger. So obviously, I can't compare a job ten years ago to a job today because that would just be ludicrous. What I will say is that people could do with stepping back from all the hype. You know, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what you're kind of shooting on as long as you're creating the final product. So all these people, especially I know with the video guys at the moment, kind of everyone's kind of rattling on about 4K. It's it's fine. I'm sure that will become the standard at some point. <laughs> but you just everyone just needs to calm down because at, at the moment everyone's kind of going, oh yeah, I've got all this 4K stuff and. You know, everyone's kind of seeing all these fantastic cameras that are coming out. I'm sure they're great. And obviously, I don't want to talk any cam you know, specific camera manufacturers down or anything. But it is the final product that counts. And, it, you know, I'm sure 4K will help. You know, people can punch in and stuff like that. But if you, if you have got the best setup in the world, uh, all this, and you've got all the hype stuff, and you're creating what is one of the worst videos people have ever seen, it's all irrelevant. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. I've started. I've started two, two, three years ago, so I already, you know, was at the end of the hype. Well, hype is still going on. I mean, Nikon is one of the examples, a very good examples actually, how to implement the high resolution sensor into a thirty-five millimeter frame. But in my particular case, uh, I entirely agree with Tom. I'm now working with medium format cameras, so cameras which go beyond fifty megapixel easily. And also over there, you can see a tremendous shift going from CCD technology to CMOS technology. So uh, sacrificing actually <coughs> resolution at the cost of dynamic range. And for example, in my field, uh, I'm, I'm really benefiting from fruits of technology. I'm shooting outdoors. I need broad dynamic range. I'm actually facing lots of set lighting situations where it's virtually impossible to find one optimal exposure value that would you know, bring the proper exposure of a person and the mountain, for example, and the snow. Hence, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I have to rely on technology. So, you know, I'm approaching, unlike high-end high portrait photographers, adventure photographers in my particular case, I, I, I really, really, really benefit fully from the technology. But having a high-resolution sensor should never be an excuse for, you know, f not framing properly. And this exactly also, in, in my mind, applies to 4K. It's mm. very nice to have 4K, but... Lots of people actually use 4K as a tool to escape from bad framing and composition. True. Aside, you know. The 4K reframing sometimes also is an opportunity. I mean, sometimes you're in a situation, rarely, but sometimes, where you, you know, there's this one chance of uh, shooting an interview with some important person and you have only one operator, you're the only operator. And, um, and they have a mis they say something, you know, they have a mis say something the wrong way and you want to cut it out. What do you do if you have just one camera and they don't do the take again? I mean, that happened to me before. Um, I cropped into the HD image. Obviously, you see that. Um, but if I have ha would have had a 4K camera, you know, I would have gotten away with it. I just fake a, a close-up. No, no, I entirely agree. I mean, in medium format, especially when you have a really high resolution count and, you know, lots of dynamic range and 16-bit color as opposed to 14-bit color. 
I mean, of course, I entirely agree. I also ended up with situations where I shot, you know, 80 megapixel photo and I were, and for example, my, my model was wearing clothing from different brands and I was able to crop out sections which went to catalog for boots and jacket manufacture from yeah. one shot. Wow. So uh, absolutely, I mean, I entirely agree. That makes perfect point. I'm just saying, you know, in general. Yeah. I mean, for, for us cinematographers, it's now a lot of people feel like, especially traditional guys, they're losing control because now the editors and the director can decide in the edit to reframe something. And very often that happens. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, you know, what used to be director photography really directed all the photography. So he even sat there with the color grader. Very often there's no, no budget for that anymore. So they don't only color grade themselves, they also basically reframe and it's, it's it's something new in our world for people who are used to this kind of freedom um, and also responsibility obviously if I'm honest I kind of feel for them because obviously with magazine stuff I've been dealing with that for years people punch in and kind of do all sorts you know and you can't really control it so yeah it's it is upsetting yeah unfortunately I do feel that it is just something that will just happen I don't think there's really any control there's nothing really we can do about it I mean, Unless we get stroppy with the with the end user. Yeah, I mean, technically it's an advantage, obviously, but uh, it takes some control away from people. But the industry will change with that, and the jobs job descriptions will change as well. I absolutely, guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely. Does any of you still shoot on film? Uh, mm. You guys? No. I'm, I'm actually planning to step to Ilford. So now I'm creating a personal project, and maybe it's going to be supported by by some external funds and uh, I want to do like a personal project on the mountains of the Europe on Info Ilford black and white films. Nice. But yeah. medium format. So really, you know, create a high resolution, funky, grainy print book about mountains of the Europe, black and white on Il from Ilford film. I, I would love that. I mean, I miss that. You miss it? Did you do it before? <coughs> I, I've done it um, hobbistically. Yeah. And I, you know, look, I'm a geek, you know, that I have a scientific <laughs> background and it, it, I just like tinkering. I, I like the development process. It's uh, something really, it's very nice to see a photo popping up on your screen and you apply manipulations and instantly see the effect. But there is some, a little bit of magic, a glimpse of magic. You know, you see this thing just developing there. Yeah. I also still learned in the dark room and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's been a while though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Miss that smell. To jump back to your question about the you know changing changing technology, 4K, high megapixel. Um, I've been in the business 14 years. I, I started shooting film in the dark room uh, originally, color and black and white, processing it myself with the Wing Lynch. Uh, not to date myself too much, but um, oh, been around a while. And I remember when digital came into the picture for still photographers originally. And there were the the mass community said, uh, "I will film is here to stay. Digital is junk. It will never be. It will never sur surpass film." And obviously, we've seen that um, that technology change. And obviously, digital has been embraced. And it's what we people around the world, their daily lives are are captured um, millions and millions of pictures every day. Um, as far as the, I shoot some video now as well. Uh, some small projects. And my sort of take on it is uh, anybody who says I'll never do something is putting them doing themselves a disservice because the industry will change. And if you don't uh, continue to grow as a, not only an artist and what you produce, um, as well as how you embrace the technology, um, you're going to be left behind and you'll be a dinosaur in a sense. So uh, I try to, <coughs> whether I embrace the technology, <coughs> I keep, try to keep abreast of it. And whether or not I'm shooting 4K today, you know, that it doesn't mean I won't be shooting it tomorrow, but I always like to know what's out there. At least know your options and be educated because an educated uh, photographer, cinematographer, is a better uh, artist than one that is not. Yeah. I think when I started out, I, I assisted a photographer. I was the assistant <coughs> of a photographer, and she had a, what was it, the D1? Mm -hmm. The original, yeah, yeah, D1. What was the resolution on that? Like three or four megapixels? I think it was 4.1 four 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 point one yeah, four point yeah. one megapixels. Uh -huh. That was around the same time I had a 128 megabyte Sandisk card, yeah. and I it thought it would be the, and I said, let me repeat that, megabyte, not <laughs> gigabyte card. And I thought, I'll never need to buy another card because I got the big card. <laughs> and now she had that, uh, the, you know, the compact flash drive, like the, the actual, I, the, IBM yeah. micro drive. the IBM micro drive, yeah. <laughs> you know, the camera, I had one of which was quite scary, but it worked yeah. quite well, actually. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, not exactly known for their reliability, though. Yeah, <laughs> and now fast forward <laughs> and like you know one 
shot is basically 100 megabytes, right? So like... Uh, With that ca camera, definitely. How yeah. big is a raw file? The raw file is almost 100 megs that's in 14 crazy. bit. Yeah. That's, See, that's, what, that's what I like about my Sony A7S. I mean... I use it for shooting video and I love mm -hmm. its low light capability, but privately I run around with it and just in the evening takes mm -hmm. a few photos. Yeah. And it's tw just 12 megapixels. <laughs> on, you know, on the other hand, it has this super low light capability. Yeah. But mm -hmm. a 12 megapixel RAW file, it's so small, you can, you know, you can fill up a card with 64 gigabytes. I think it's like 2,500 RAW files <laughs> and JPEG. So yeah. that's pretty nice. Obviously, not enough for photography, like professional photography. No, oh. not really. I mean, it depends, it depends, it it depends, depends entirely on where you're yeah. putting the when you're putting exactly. the final product. Yeah. Do you always decide on shooting the highest resolution? I mean, <coughs> raw kind of you know you always need to basically, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I yeah. personally, I've I wish you raw. Yeah, I always feel like you, you know, no matter what it is, you might as well start with the highest possible quality because mm -hmm. you can't go back to that. You can always downsize it. Yeah. Later, I mean, I, and I think the on the other hand, that's an, that, an, uh, that's an interesting thought because the other side of the job that we that I didn't have when I shot film was I put slides and sheets and put them in a file cabinet. Now, all, the, all this data, where do we put it? You yeah. know, um, you know, m lots of lots of ones and zeros. <coughs> how do you deal with it? I mean, if you have one shot with a hundred megs, how a uh, hundred megabytes? Yeah. Um, how many how many shots do you take on the average job? And how do you deal with all the storage workflow well i shoot a lot of action sports uh surfing kayaking where i'm shooting uh motor drive so i mean i may walk away away from a project with you know terabytes of data and that's you know that's a, a large percentage of my years i'm shooting projects that you know require shooting sunrise or before sunrise through sunset and you're shooting all day we're shooting video and uh all, you know i shoot all raw and i like to shoot raw plus jpeg as well because the JPEGs are, are nice because they're kind of finished files, easy to send to a client for review, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, not only are you getting the RAW, but you're getting a, also a JPEG in, on top of that. And uh, it's, it's interesting because it originally it became a little overwhelming. I've now developed a workflow that I'm pretty comfortable with because, you know, you're thinking, if you say you shoot um, 100 gigs in a day, right? That's a big day. But, like, because... And it usually comes in when we're shooting multiple video cameras, you know, and such, um, you know, D810s or D4Ss. And all of a sudden, you've got this stack of compact flashcards at the end of the day, and you're downloading, and you're like, wow, where's it going to go? Um, and I just, every day, I'm thankful that we no longer use USB 2. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> because <laughs> now that we have Thunderbolt and uh, USB 3 and, um, you know, drives like the G Drive EV with SSDs, on site, we can back up, and I can actually have like a normal, a normal job in a sense, because I'm not spending like all night base backing up and getting the, the data safe. Mm -hmm. True. I think that's what a lot of people overlook. That you know, for video, I mean, if you even if you use cameras that don't have high data rate, it's still beneficial to use fast cards because of the offload process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You save so much time. I mean, if an average uh, shooting day is like 12 hours, mm -hmm. maybe 14 and you spend another three hours offloading the stuff, it's terrible. Um, so I'd rather have the expensive cards offload yeah. everything at once. Yeah, every, faster. every megabyte per second counts in that yep. situation. Yeah, and you want to go to sleep and you still have to be yeah. w looking at that bar <laughs> moving. Yeah, or, or actually get to eat or something, you know, have a meal. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't feed my people, you know. So. Life, what is that? <laughs> Thanks for watching this segment of Cinema 5D on the couch with Camille, Tom and Lucas. And if you want to hear more from them, tune in for the next segment. Also, thanks to our sponsors, Qi Technology, Rode Microphones, Movidium.com, Home Convert and FNB. Thanks for watching.